Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. In this video, I'm very excited to share with you a brilliant game that was played at a Georgian chess championship. That's right, my home country. That is where I am from originally. That is going on currently in Tbilisi. All right. Now let's jump into a tournament first for a little bit of a context and then we'll get to the game. As you can see, there have been six rounds played so far and uh, Badur Jobala, leader of Georgian chess for over a decade or at least as long as I remember myself, is leading the tournament with four and a half points out of six games, as we said. And there are three players here trailing, looks like, uh, a point behind. Now, I want to mention that national championships are usually a pretty big deal for professional chess players. Not only because of bragging rights and the prize fund, but team competitions, all right? This tournament determines who gets into the national team to play Olympiad or different team tournaments, basically. European uh, club cup, I believe, club tournaments. I don't think we play world um, club tournament, but you get the point. That being said, let's jump now into our game. So this game that I want to show you was played between my two dear friends. White player is Grandmaster Giga Kuparadze. All right. Phenom of Georgian chess, I would say, and a world-class blitz or fast time control player. He actually is one of the first players that when I started playing chess, I got to meet. We are from the same city and the player that I looked up to for all my childhood, pretty much. All right. Now, black player is also a dear friend, Grandmaster Luka Pajadze, also a well-known figure for the Georgian chess. Let's get into the game here. And I want to mention that I think this is a really good illustration on how to play against a Gurgenidze variation, black plays c6, g6 system against e4. Here, let's see it more in detail. d4, d5, knight c3, we have Karokan on the board. Surprise, surprise, at the Georgian championship, we have Karokan at the board. <laughs> well, a little bit of a pre-context to it is literally everyone plays Karokan in Georgia, all right? Now, after knight c3, Luka decides to go with g6, Gurgenidze variation. Now, named after the legend of Georgian chess, a very first grandmaster from Georgia, Buhuti Gurgenidze, all right? He uh, used this system quite frequently. Now, e5. I actually myself also have played this with black quite extensively. e5, now Giga decides to grab the space immediately and strengthen the center followed with f4 most likely next. Now bishop g7 and h3. h3 is a prophylactic measure against bishop g4. White tries not to allow black to trade this dark square bishop for either knight or a bishop, because then it turns out that, let's say, if black trades this bishop and then plays e6, black gets to play good version of French, right? This, this pawn structure without a problem child <laughs> or c8 bishop inside the pawn chain, right? Stuck inside the pawn chain here. So h3, f6 was played in the game. Now Luka decides to challenge the center immediately. White says, no, obviously I don't want to give up my center that easily, f4, to strengthen it. And this is probably the first critical moment of the game. c5, which as you see, computer says is a mistake. Black is simply not ready to open up the position because they have not developed a single piece. Now you may say this bishop, but well, is that bishop really developed? 
it is still inside the pawn chain here. It is hitting the brick, which is the e5 pawn, and barely contributes into anything, pretty much, into black's position, right? So white goes knight f3, continues the loping here, and does not mind taking on d4, because as we see, Giga had an intermediate move here, prepared bishop b5 check. Now let's see what is the result of first eight moves here. White has brought three minor pieces into the game so far, while black has only done one, and that one even is hardly developed, all right? So the idea of this bishop b5 check is to ask black the question, basically, how are you gonna block it? If you block it with knight c6, which looks most natural, then now knight takes d4 is gonna come with the tempo, and Black is in serious trouble here. You have problem defending c6 knight. If you defend it with bishop d7, which would be the most natural move, then white goes e6 here, and oh man, um, you have to move the bishop away, and you're gonna lose the material, and the house, and the game pretty much. All right, so you can do knight c6 and then bishop d7. Now, I guess uh, moves like um, maybe queen c7, but if you move queen c7, then this pawn is hanging on d5. So. Luca realizes that, okay, this is a problem. Now, if I go bishop to d7, I believe there's still knight d4, knight e6 threats. Oh man, uh, this does not look good. So black decides to move the king away. So on top of all the advantages, obviously advantages. Now black has also lost castling rights. So queen takes d4, three minor pieces, and the queen already in the game. As we see, bishop on g7 is the only developed piece, but I would not call that piece uh, developed. Now, black plays e6 to protect the d5 pawn, and knight goes to e4. I would say first strong move from the white side. Actually, white had played a series of strong moves here, but knight e4 now brings knight into a black's camp here without any obstacles pretty much because you cannot really take this knight your pin to the queen and if you try to be smart and go for this bishop on b5 well white says be, be my guest bishop to d2 and if you do take there there will be knight d6 now winning a queen in the game so knight e4 there is nothing that black can do about this. Um, a6, bishop retreats back to a4, b5. It is actually quite instructive here that black still keeps playing with the pawns. Th those are the only pieces they have been playing with so far. Now knight goes to d6 check first, in intermediate check, king retreats back, and then bishop to b3. Knight goes to c6, finally black is able to get the first piece into the game here. Queen to c5, now attacking the knight. So knight g e7 is more or less forced here. And Giga chooses to continue with the most forcing continuation. I would say most likely what I would do in this position is probably go short castle and then try to open up the f file somehow. But Giga chat. Giga Chad, that's not what, what he thinks. He's going for it immediately, all right? Let's open up the F5 with F5. I would give this an exclamation mark, actually. Um, not because it's hard to see what happens next, but because it is, in the style of Fisher, the most straightforward approach. Now, take on E5, I think is gonna open up either actually FG or FE here, maybe then Knight G5. Short castle, king is exposed on the f file. This is not gonna end up well. So Luca decides, okay, at least I'm gonna try to keep f file closed with g takes f5, then e takes f6, bishop takes f6, bishop to h6 check. Now, last undeveloped minor piece of white come into the play with the tempo, bishop h6. Black moves the king away, g4. 
All right, no break, no chill. Let's open up the G file now, since you have your king position there. Knight to E5, try to attack the unprotected piece here on F3 and use the fact that if we take here, then bishop takes E5. And surprisingly enough, actually, all white's advantage is gone after knight e5. Before knight e5, white was plus 5 and in other lines maybe plus 3. All right? And after knight e5, game is equal. So this should give us an idea how fast it can switch. All right? Like, like that. One mistake may be enough for our advantage to evaporate. And I think... This should be a good example on time-sensitive and not time-sensitive advantages, which probably we should talk in separate video, but this is a time-sensitive advantage, all right? Initiative in general is time-sensitive. For example, pawn structure would be not so time-sensitive because weak pawn structure is, is weak for long periods of time. But if you have the initiative, and you do not act in the most pressing manner, right? If you do not act on it on time, that advantage is gonna evaporate, all right? So that would be the case here after knight d5 because now knight on d6 is in trouble and if you take there, then rook takes c8 and suddenly tables has turned here, queen d6 and black now is quite safe on f7 and uh, remains an extra pawn. All right, so it's definitely not what wants to do here. White wanted to get the king away here from the center. Why don't we do it immediately? And here we have first brilliancy of the game. White sacrifices the knight on f3, completely ignores that piece for the sake of bringing heavy artillery into the attack. Now, what I mean by heavy artillery is if you take there, I believe there will be g takes f5, and then rook g1 chop is a deadly threat. Let's see if knight takes f5. Probably white plays here rook g1, knight g1, let's say knight takes g1. And if you block it with knight g7, there is a deadly move here. Bishop takes d5. Last piece that was not participating in, into the game, right, comes now into the game with devastating effect. If you take back queen takes d5 and f7 will be a checkmate by the way bishop e6 doesn't really block it because oops because it's pinned along the g file and you're gonna get mated anyways on f7 now after bishop d5 if you move the rook away what then well uh, computer finds queen a7 uh, attacking f7 square obviously a rook as well but the main threat here is to checkmate king with queen f7 or rook g7 that will also be a mate. Let's say if you do bishop d7, now bishop to e6, and black is simply running out of power here. If you take back, then rook takes g7, and if you take with the bishop, queen will be a checkmate. If you move the king, then move the rook anywhere else, and then it's going to be a checkmate on the next move. All right, so uh, Luca says, no, thank you. I see that knight f3 may lead to a lot of troubles so black plays knight back to f7 trying to trade this knight all right so the king has some breathing air all right breathing room also attacking the bishop here so white is now forced to trade that knight king takes f7 g5 now forcing the trade of dark squared bishops as well. Now, keep in mind here that this bishop was a quite good of a defender, right? If we take here, then knight takes f5, attacking the bishop. And again, it is going to be tricky here to open up uh, the position. Now, computer says that rook d5 is the way to do it, but okay, <laughs> we, when, when you're playing this with white, you're not always looking here to sacrifice the material, right? You want to, uh, you, were, you were winning already for a um, long time since the beginning. So major agenda here, I believe for white is not to allow counterplay from black. So g5, bishop g7, trades dark square bishop. And now we see that these dark squares 
will become very weak. That's what happens. Queen goes to c3. King cannot go to f7 because there will be 95 checks. So king has to go back to g8 and rook h to e1. White brings last undeveloped piece into the game. Right? It's hard to call that h rook undeveloped because he's already been in the game here basically creating threats but it was the first physical move made with that rook. That's, that's what I have in mind. Here, a5, black tries to create some counterplay here with a4, but that is not the case. Best defense is always an offense, if we have an option, obviously. Queen goes to f6, now if a4, I believe there's gonna be bishop d5, and there are way too many pins here along both d and e5 and on the diagonal, so you cannot really touch that bishop. And then there's gonna be captures here on e6, so entire house falls apart pretty much. So on queen f6, white plays, uh, excuse me, black plays queen to f8, and here we have next brilliancy of the game, as chess.com likes to put it, rook takes e6. Now obviously white does not want to trade queens and go for the end game here, especially with a pawn down. So rook takes e6, taking down now black's defenses here. Now if you take queen f6, insist on trading, well, all right. Now we got rid of that e6 pawn, uh, which was putting black's position, which was keeping black's position together pretty much. Now d5 pawn is also gonna fall. And then once rook comes in there, that h8 rook is still offside. So game is pretty much decided here as well. So after rook takes e6, black accepts an exchange sacrifice here, but that will give new life to a light, light square bishop that we have on b3. So queen goes to f7, queen d6, no two trades here. Black brings rook into the game here. Now, important element here, I believe, for us is to understand that, yes, black does have an extra material, but white pieces are way more active, all right? So if we think in terms of relative value of our pieces now, this rook it has probably close to zero value, all right? Because it is not contributing into black's position at any degree. So knight goes to e5, kicking that queen away and threatening to take on d5 here uh, with, I would assume, probably with the rook and then take with the bishop and then that's going to be a checkmate there, right? If you do that, I believe uh, we can do that. And then if you take there, takes there, queen h6 should be a mate. So black plays knight to c8. Uh, now, white could have, keep trying to avoid queen trade here, but knight c8, since it is attacking the queen, and if we take the queen, then um, black will have to take our queen and the knight will be defending it. So we end up two minor pieces for a rook, but more importantly, all black pieces here, the all black pawns are gonna fall apart. And also this h8 rook still has some time to get into the game. Now, rook f8 takes on b5, then I believe now, yep, knight returns back to d4, threatening knight e6. d5 is also hanging here. That's what happens next. White tries to push the pass pawn here. Black tries to push the pass pawn here, but we should be for check. Uh, king moves on the side. You can't touch that guy because knight e6 here. Uh, rook to g1. I actually like the end of the game here. King goes to h4, knight to f3, check. If taking on h3, I believe there's gonna be bishop d3 and black has no way to stop the mate. He plays king to h5 and again, rook goes to g4, threatening rook h4, checkmate, which will be impossible to stop. Maybe rook f5, but then simply bishop takes f5 and that is going to be a mate. What a game by Giga. Well, good luck to both players in the remainder of the tournament, but uh, 
congrats Giga on this game and uh, looking forward to seeing many more exciting games. I hope you guys enjoyed this game. I know that I did personally enjoy watching it. To give a quick recap here, this is what happens when one side violates opening principles and does not double up pieces, make too many moves with the pawns, like c5 here, and then it all went uh, down, I would say, after this, then knight e4, bringing a knight to d6, white took control of the game and never let it go. All right. I hope you enjoyed this one, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.